so the other questions I wanted to wrap up with is figure out a couple of things. One, the new book is um, it written specifically for young adults. Uh -huh. um, it's it's essentially about character taking control of the, the, the software environment around them and it kind of are you into historical science fiction like Jules Verne, Edward Bellamy? Um, there's there's a couple other novels that really to me foregrounded this one. One is Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards, which is a really interesting science fiction book set in the near future of America where everyone is essentially like li living with credit cards and he predicts a lot of really interesting things that are going on now. There's also a Soviet uh, science fiction writer named Yevgeny Zemnyatin who wrote a book called We. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main character begins to dream in irrational numbers. And uh, that creates a situation where it's a paradox in the society and uh, he's being chased by these people and so on. But the totalitarian motif seems to really keep coming up you know, in some of your work. I mean, do you feel in the next 10 years or so any of these are resonant with reality as we know it, or is science fiction kind of more of a prophecy, like Bruce Sterling, William Gibson, in that tradition, or? I think science fiction writers predict the present. Uh, even when they think they're predicting the future, I think they predict the present, because, you know, you read, you read for example, um, Asimov and, and the things that he was anxious about in his fiction, and it was things that were that were happening in his contemporary time, or Heinlein, or, or any of the you know kind of the greats. They're all they're all sitting there writing about stuff that's happening right then, as though it were happening in the future, and making predictions about. We live at the unfortunate confluence of uh, of of two uh, technological problems. Um, the 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 first one is a social technology, which or, or maybe a psychological technology, which is uh, we figured out to uh, a really fine degree how to exploit the cognitive defect that human beings have in assessing risk, uh, especially ex assessing the risks of rare occurrences. So, you know, that, that we are really, really bad at calculating probability unless we have a pen and paper handy. Our intuition about probability is really bad. Uh, you know, the, the, the classic one is the Monty Hall uh, everyone, anyone not know the Monty Hall thing? So you know, but but it's all around us. You get off an airplane and you get off uh, an airplane at McCarran Airport in Vegas, and you step out onto the Strip, and the rational statistical mind should look at those casinos and go, "There's no way they built these unless there was no way to win." I should get back on the plane, right? But but the, the, we have really figured out how to exploit a bug in our cognition, so that when people look at those casinos, what they think is. All the money that's there is to be won by me, right? I, you know, let me let me warm up my wallet and lose everything. So you can you can take these meteor strike rare occurrences like terrorism, uh, like um, uh, uh, what's the Monty Hall thing? The, oh, the Monty Hall thing. So the Monty Hall thing uh, is is this famous, infamous now mathematical proof that turned the mathematics world on its ear, which is. Um, if Monty Hall put, takes you on, let's make a deal, and there's three doors, and he says, behind one of these doors is a, is a car, and between the other two is a goat. Uh, which door would you like? And you say door number one, and he, said, and he says, well, I know which door the car is behind, and it's not behind car number three, or door number three. Should you switch or stick to, to, to get the best chance of winning? You have the best chance of winning if you see, now there's two doors. Door number three doesn't have the car. You pick door number one. Should you pick door number two, or should you stick, or does it make no difference? And the answer is that you should switch. Um, and I, I can get into the statistical proof with you later, but you should switch. And we have really bad intuition about this. And until you sit down with a pen and paper and really work it out, it's very hard to understand why you should switch. So I think we have this crummy, um, uh, uh, we have this crummy intuition about the statistics of rare occurrences. And as a result, you can just sort of say. Just in your mind, hold the image of the incredibly rare occurrence of an airplane crashing into a building filled with people. And whenever you try to consider a policy question, allow this to overrule any objections that you have in your mind. Just think back to this incredibly lurid moment, right? Um, allow yourself to be to, 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 to hearken back to that terrible story you saw in the news of the child who was abducted by a stranger. And whenever anything comes up and you think about your child's safety, Think about that, that, that thing that happened with that stranger and allow that to overrule every other consideration. And it turns out to be a really effective technology for changing the way people think. The other technology that we live in the middle of is the surveillance technology, right? Computers have made it now possible to surveil in a way that was never conceivable before. And that doesn't mean that the state knows everything you do, but that does mean that any time the state wants to prove that you've done something wrong, they have ample evidence to do so. As Cardinal Rishi Liu said, uh, give me six lines in an honest man's hand and I'll find, you in them, I'll find in them a reason for you to hang him. So the, the confluence of being able to convince people that we are all at risk from these very rare occurrences 
and that we should all be surveilled all the time to make ourselves safe from them, has made it possible to arrogate any power that anyone wants to arrogate who's in position to conduct these two things. And that's the dystopian moment that we live in. It's almost similar, and if you look at North Korea, what's going on with the whole notion of the, the cult of personality that Kim Jong Il's instituted, and the way that, that that kind of surveillance based on actual people, you know, literally monitoring you. <clears throat> with us, it's actually become algorithmic. I mean, that's what's so fascinating. I mean, um, as an artist, I'm actually very fascinated with how you look at statistical modeling. And actually, in his book um, and in my book, we have I have uh, Manuel Delanda who wrote a really good book called The War. Um, uh, God, the War. Uh, War in the Ages of Intelligent Machines, uh, which is kind of looking at cybernetic strategy or games theory as applied to how computer systems and creativity you know, intersect. Um, and in my book, I had him write an essay on kind of looking at algorithms and creativity and, and making music. Uh, but in your book, uh, there's a really interesting chapter where uh, the, the, the young hacker kid is trying to figure out um, I think it's a reverse statistical model. I can't remember the exact. The, the beating histograms. Yeah, exactly. Bayesian Bayesian statistics. Yeah. So like the 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 Bruce Schneier calls the present model of danger detection the war on the unknown. <coughs> right. You you basically you start with a statistical baseline of what you expect people to be doing, and anytime someone does anything that deviates, you kind of clobber them on the grounds that they're probably doing something wrong. And and so again, as kind of a room full of happy mutants, this sh it should be immediately apparent to you why this this just doesn't work. Why it is that just because you're the guy who's wearing the T-shirt that says something that no one else understands doesn't mean that you're up to doing uh, doesn't mean that you're up to no good. Just because you're the person reading the book that's different from everyone else's book doesn't mean that you're up to no good. I mean, one of the fundamental characteristics of a democracy is that it's supposed to protect minority points of view. And so the war on the unknown, this, this notion of, of attacking anything that falls outside the statistical norm and, and subjecting anyone who falls outside the statistical norm to heightened scrutiny is really counter to this democratic tradition. It's really dangerous. But you've got to remember there was a series of uh, scandals in the Bush administration where there was um, Poindexter who was talking about creating this kind of um, sort of stop futures market for terrorism. Mm -hmm. And uh, that actually, they are doing this at, you know, in Apple's Naval Military College and a couple other spots where they're trying to figure out if you attach certain values and criteria of judgment to algorithmic processes looking at um, fixed events, um, how do you, you know, sort of do predictive modeling, which is actually a very Philip K. Dick motif as well. Um, so when I look at... I'm, I'm waiting for the hedge fund bubble. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's, I, seriously, actually. There's, there's a science fiction story for you. The guy who creates the hedge fund bubble, bubble in, the, in the terrorist futures market. <laughs> <laughs> 